There's nothing I'd rather do The storm may rise, the trumpet sound The curtain tear And even now return to you There's nothing I'd rather do Than return to you Does my mic work? Okay. Awkward, because it's... Is it on? Is it on now? Is it on? Is it on? <laughs> Hello? Well, I'm not going to undress in front of you. So I shall sneak out during the passing of the peace and hope that all is well. Did I say God is with you? Okay. And it's been that kind of morning. I've been running wild since I got here this morning, so thank you for your patience. 
We're glad you're here. This is joint services between McDougal United Church and Ogden United Church. And we have a few announcements as we begin. First of all, you, we hope you'll join us for the Lenten book study on the Divine Dance by Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr is a priest who is rethinking all these sort of orthodoxies of the church, particularly the Trinity and what the Trinity is. So his book, The Divine Dance, is going to be our book study during Lent. It'll begin on Wednesday, February 21st. That's this Wednesday, 6 p.m. Continue through the season of Lent. Uh, this is dinner in Divine Dance, so we are going to order in food and uh, meet at 6 o'clock actually downstairs. In the multi There's a multi-purpose room downstairs <laughs> you probably don't know about. It used to be called, what is it now? Burning Bush. Burning Bush. So if you'd like to join us, please do come if you could let us know so we know how much food to order. That'd be great. And if you just can't do Wednesday, but you'd like to do the study, R Reverend Dane is leading the study at Red Deer Lake on Thursdays at 7 p.m., which is dessert and divine dance. So um, you will get dessert. It's a little later. Um, so contact the office if you're interested so that you can learn more. He's a great thinker and is really influential in... Uh, progressive theology and moving into new spaces. So please do join us if you can. I think Darren's giving an announcement. Are you giving an announcement? No? Go ahead. Okay. No, but they won't, they won't hear you on the tape. So you do that and I'm gonna go turn my mic on. You turn your mic on, I'll just run up here and give you the announcement. Woohoo, all right, I don't need a mic. Uh, so next uh, Sunday is our annual general meeting, yes! Isn't that exciting? A time of a lifetime. Um, and so in this week's e-blast, the annual report was there, the uh, budget, and our financial statements. So please make sure you look those over before next week's meeting. Uh, we also are looking for people to help with the luncheon. In past years, we've had uh, sandwiches. So if you're able to bring a loaf of sandwiches, just come and see me afterwards and or email or let the office know or square. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, and again, that could be your goodwill offering uh, because we do appreciate those, those extra meals and extra food there. So next Sunday, annual general meeting, if you're able to bring a loaf of sandwiches or a square to share, please let me know, um, and please make sure you've read the uh, budget, because there's a lot of discussion that we need to have around that budget and, and the future of McDougal. So thank you very much, and back to Reverend Joanne. There we go. See? I turned myself on. Anyway, that came out wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, we also have uh, an appeal that we're trying to do um, in this time. As you know, the, um, the war is raging in Gaza, and we have supported uh, two Palestinian families, actually, over our time. And their family is actually in Rafah. And as you know, that's going to be the next hotspot. I'm just going to invite, if you have those pictures, just to scroll through some of them. Oh, one minute. So I'll tell you about it, and then we'll look at some pictures of Mustafa's family. McDougal United and Christ Moravian Refugee Support Group is requesting you make a special donation to help the immediate family. Here they are. Immediate uh, family members of Mustafa's family. Palestinians whom the McDougal congregation supported as refugees to Canada in 2017. Their large immediate family in Gaza has been subject to increasing danger since the war began in October. And by early November, 127 members of their extended family had been killed. Their surviving family members are now in the Rafah camp, which is being bombed by the Israeli Defense Force. Food and other basic life necessities are in short supply in the camp. Mustafa's family is sending as much money as they can to their family to help them survive, but they will soon need help to get their family out of Rafa. There's posters. This is where they are in the camp now. Posters with pictures of these family members before the war and now in the camp are in the main hall and in hospitality hall and also here 
on our screen today. The McDougall United Christ Moravian Refugee Support Group is donating funds to help them, but we also need your help. So please make your donations to McDougall United Church Refugee Fund and indicate in support of Palestinian family in the memo line if you can. And if you prefer, you can help Palestinians by making a donation to UNICEF, Doctors Without Borders, or the United Church. All donations are tax deductible. Thank you for your encouragement and support for this family and your ongoing support for our current Afghan refugee families. We cannot do this work without you. That's a message from Marjorie McRae and the Refugee Committee. And I know that this issue is politically charged. But it was like last week during our prayers when I said what we are commanded to do is love, even if we disagree on the issues. This is a family we have connection with and we know that needs our help. And we can see from the um, pictures that you see on the news every day that life in Gaza is very difficult. So if you could make a donation to support the family of one of our refugee families, that would be so appreciated. That is love in action. And, you know, there's lots of ways to support our community as well. Um, nothing happens here without you, without your care, your love, your connections with each other, your support of our programs by being here and also your financial donations. We are so grateful for all we can do, and even though there's budget issues that will be coming up next week, we believe McDougall is a vital part of this community and that it will be for decades to come with your help. So thank you. We're going to begin our service with a call to worship which is on the screen. Come in, feel your feet on the floor, settle your worries, take a deep breath, dust the cobwebs from your ears, relax the tension in your jaw. We have been found. Let us worship the God of deep waters. Amen. So let's sing together how deep the peace as we prepare to light our Christ candle. This is a poem by Sarah Speed. I put my headphones in. I walk quickly, I look toward the ground. I create one million barriers of independence, but still, God seeks after me. 
God leans a rainbow over the sky. God sends sun after the rain. God blankets the earth with wild. And so we light our Christ candle. I think you need to turn down the volume on my mic. We light this Christ candle. God has been chasing after me all the time, seeking us. Jesus showed us the way to live in God's kingdom. And so we light this candle remembering the way of Jesus, the call of God, and our lives lived in their care. Amen. So I invite you to stand as we sing together our opening hymn. Please be seated. You probably noticed that Tanya's not at the piano today. She and Jonathan have gone to Mexico without children. <laughs> On a honeymoon, she said. So uh, we're glad that she has some rest and grateful for Karen, who is my sister. <laughs> She's the one. <laughs> Karen and I spent many hours, she playing the <laughs> We come from so many different places, don't we? When we see our news and those pictures of Mustafa's family, we know the world. The 
poverty, war, climate emergencies, there in so many places. We feel blessed to be here and yet we have our struggles too, all of us. But in the midst of that, there are always glimmers of glory and joy to find. In our scripture passage for today, we'll read about Jesus calling Peter to be a disciple. And in the story, Peter's in the presence of the divine for quite some time before he realizes it. And Jesus crawls into Peter's boat and he tells him to head toward the deep water. And together they let the nets down and it's only when the boat threatens to sink due to the extreme fish that Peter turns to Jesus and truly sees who is in the boat with them. Sometimes we miss what's right in front of us. Fortunately, Jesus keeps crawling into our boats anyhow. So join me in the prayer, not out of fear, but out of a desire to finally see who's right in front of us, in the boat with us. So let us pray, I'll do the yellow, you can do the black. Loving God, you call us by name, you join us in the deep waters of life. Over and over again, we, sta we stand slack-jawed and surprised to find you in our midst. Turn our hearts, our minds, and our spirits toward you, for you are our God, and it is in your name that we pray. So I invite you to just rest for a moment. And imagine this is the boat we're all in, and Jesus is among us. God of all, sometimes it seems like you choose the most ridiculous people to be your servants. And we feel inadequate even as we're inspired. And so we pray in this time of wandering through Lent that you would meet us in the boat that we would find abundance and share that abundance with all those who are in the boat with us and some of those who are lost on the shore. Teach us to walk in the way of Jesus as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We have come together this morning for renewal. In worship and as a community of faith, we've greeted one another, we've laughed and hugged so far, but now the time of reflection and stillness is upon us. The first Sunday of Lent, the season for journeys of the heart. Close your eyes, be still, listen. We are entering a holy time. The Lenten candles have been lit, but over the next six weeks, the light will slowly fade into darkness. For we are retelling the story of Jesus' betrayal and suffering and death, and we do this not to be morbid, but because in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, God is revealed. In the amazing transformation of death into life, in endings transformed into beginnings, and in dead ends that become a source for new possibilities. 
This is the sacred center of our faith. The truth made manifest in Jesus that God is in each and every one of us, quietly transforming us in the world. In his pain and suffering, Jesus speaks to every pain and loss you have endured and offers you the promise of transformation. It's an old story, but still has the power to reveal, to heal, and to redeem. Jesus is at the heart of our faith, in the depths of our souls, is waiting for us, inviting us to leave ordinary time and follow along with him on the journey that brought him to the cross. So listen in silence for Jesus is calling you. And as we extinguish the light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of injustice in the world. One candle has always been extinguished, already been extinguished, that was on Ash Wednesday. So I invite you to pray with me. Loving God, as we journey through the holy season of Lent, give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives. Open our hearts and minds to your steadfast presence and help us to put our trust in you. Amen. Peter didn't exactly make a good first impression when Jesus got into the boat. He questioned dropping his nets as they hadn't caught any fish all night. He was oblivious to who Jesus was for quite some time. And once he realized the Holy One standing in his boat, he quickly deemed himself and even still, Jesus called Peter a disciple and a friend. So, beloved of God, hear and believe the good news. You can make a thousand bad impressions. You can make every mistake in the book, roll your eyes and assume you know better. And even still, you are forgiven. Claim it and continue to seek in your heart. That is the good news of the gospel. Rest, celebrate, and trust in that, amen. And so we pass the peace, and as we do today, we're going to stand, and we have a responsive reading. I believe in a God of abundance. I believe in a God who comforts. I believe in a God who invites. I believe in a God who seeks after me relentlessly and persistently. Amen. So the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Pass the peace. And then any kids who are here can go with Dana to uh, oh, uh, kids' table. Salmon fishing. Oh, 
sung along with that one, but that, that is the song that Karen and I uh, clashed over this week. Amazing. We got through it, and it was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I like to do things really fast. Sometimes that's hard for fingers on the piano. We're going into a time of prayer. There are a few things to mention from our community, first of all. We celebrated the marriage of Rick Cunningham and Sandra Miller on Friday here in our sanctuary, and so our blessings on their life together go with them. They are an older couple. I think he said he turned 69, so it's always good that people in the uh, last third of their lives, let's say, find someone to share it with, so wonderful. I wanted to mention this because I don't know if it's been mentioned. I had a note for myself a long time ago to mention um, I don't know if you guys remember Stella Patel, who used to come to our services, and maybe you've heard this, but Stella passed away last July, actually, and we only found out when we tried to send her a Christmas card, I think it was, and we got a note. And I don't want to forget mentioning her, because um, she was a woman who had a lot of struggles and such great faith. So our prayers are with Stella. Yesterday, we celebrated the life of Stephen Belenke. So prayers for Kathy and Stephen's family. Into a new place. I heard the place was packed. He was a member of this congregation really before my time. And um, younger than should have been, as I understand it. So prayers for the Belenke family. 
Sarah, who's our communications uh, person, and her husband Kiki uh, had kind of a rough week. Kiki's mom, whose name is Sida, had a ma pretty major stroke on Sunday night last week, February 11th. She's stable at the Foothills Hospital, but has a long recovery ahead of her. And her family is on 24 seven shifts as she is mostly communicating in her native language, which is Laos. But we are hoping, Sarah's hoping speech will continue to come back. So we remember these people in our prayers, those who are sick, those who are mourning and grieving, those who have embarked on a new journey of life. For all those things, we are grateful, God. And we bring them to you and release them in the knowledge that your light shines on all. So our prayers today, I forgot to bring the music. Can I borrow music? Our prayers today are a bit different. Um, over the next while, at least while I'm here, we're going to use Psalms for our prayers in particular from a book called Psalms for Praying, an Invitation to Wholeness. And we're gonna sing this song, which you heard at the beginning, Return to You, but um, we'll learn it little by little. And I'm going to invite us to just sing the chorus, which is the part you'll always sing as we begin our prayers. I lift my soul. O oh, heart within my heart, in you I place my trust. Let me not feel unworthy. Let not fear rule over me. Yes, may all who open their hearts savor you and bless the earth. Compel me to know your ways, O oh, love. Instruct me upon your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for through you will I know wholeness. I shall reflect your light both day and night. I've read the story. glory because you say we're worthy I've sung every song for you but I have a wandering heart and a fickle faith can you find me Of 
your mercy, blessed one, and of your unconditional love. You have been with me from the beginning. Forgive the many times I've walked away from you, choosing to follow my own will. I seek your guidance once again. I yearn to know your peace. Companion me as I open to your will. You are gracious and just, O spirit of truth, happy to guide those who miss their way. You enjoy teaching all who are open, all who choose to live in truth. Your paths are loving and sure, O holy one. And those who give witness to you through their lives are blessed beyond measure. Yet all too often glorious gifts of grace, of love and light are veiled by my busyness. I come to you, instruct me that I might choose the way of love and truth. I would live in your abundant love and my children as well. Your friendship is offered to all whose hearts are open. You make known your promises to them. My eyes are ever on you, beloved. Keep my feet from stumbling along the way as we return to you. Envelop me with your love, for I am lonely and oppressed. Relieve the blocks in my heart that keep me separated from you. See all the darkness within me. Fill it with your healing light. Look at my pain and all my fears. They shut out love and life. Protect me and free me. Let me not live as unworthy, for I would return home to you. May integrity and wholeness fill me as I dwell with you, O oh, loving presence. And may we, together with the angels and the company of heaven, help unfold your plan for planet Earth as we return to you. Help me return. There's nothing I'd rather do than return to you. There's nothing I'd rather do. The storm may rise, the trumpet sound, the curtain tear, and even now return to you. There's nothing. Amen.
Scripture today is from um, the Kindle edition, Priest for Equality, the Inclusive Bible, the first egalitarian translation. One day, Jesus was standing by Lake Gensere, and the crowd pressed in on him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats moored by the side of the lake. The fishers had disembarked and were washing their nets. Jesus stepped into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to pull out a short distance from the shore. Then, remaining seated, he continued to teach the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, pull out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Rabbi, we've been working hard all night long and have caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll lower the nets. Upon doing so, they caught such a great number of fish that their nets were at the breaking point. They signaled to their mates in the other boat to come and help them and together they filled the two boats until they both nearly sank. After Simon saw what happened, he was filled with awe and fell down before Jesus, saying, leave me, Rabbi, for I am a sinner. For Simon and his shipmates were astonished at the size of the catch they had made, as were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish among humankind. And when they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him.
Will you pray with me? Creator God, you hear everything. You hear the rush of the wind through the trees. You hear a baby's first cry. You hear the crickets chirping, our silent prayers and laughter around tables. You hear it all. We don't need that same capacity, but we do need to hear your word, O oh God. For we cannot live on bread alone. So today we pray, give us the ability to truly listen. Give us the ability to listen with our hearts and may the truths revealed in your scripture today change us with hearts full of gratitude, we pray, amen. We've started a new series called The Wandering Heart, and that's why you see these banners here, a heart with a trail in it. And this series is a series on Peter and Peter's encounters with Jesus and his struggles, really, to become, eventually, the head of the church. It's a long road. I'm one of those people who just loves dreaming about renovations. Every house I've ever lived in can be improved in some way. A new kitchen. Take down a wall or two. Paint a feature wall deep red. Remember when that was all the rage? The feature wall. Whenever we look to purchase a house, I kind of gravitate towards the bargain that is a bit awkward, and I dream of things you could do to improve the flow or the resale value. I can usually see past the cosmetic issues to the foundation of the house, at least I believe I can. And I love that phrase, this house has good bones. Who doesn't love a makeover? There's entire television shows dedicated to transformation of houses and people. My husband, Dave, poor soul, is drawn into my schemes way too often. And we finally decided that if we do anything major to the house we're in now and there are major things to do, we're gonna pay someone to do it instead of me. Dave, wouldn't you like to replace that kitchen? Because you see, the thing is that I don't do the work. I just watch. And I used to say, I don't, there's nothing I love more than watching Dave work. So <laughs> I've tried to change my ways. I recently ran across a YouTuber, her name's uh, Jenna Phipps, and her tagline is, I make things. And what caught my eye about Jenna's feed is that, like me, she loves a project. But she is way more extreme than me. And recently, she purchased an abandoned house, which she is hoping to restore. And she, like me, is a sucker for, this house has good bones. So here's a few clips of her work so far. I bought myself an abandoned home because it's cheaper than a livable one. So right when we walk in, let's keep expectations on the floor. As we make our way through, we see buckets everywhere because when it's raining outside, it's raining inside. This, this recently fell. This is the most beautiful living room I've ever seen in my life. Next door is dining room. The previous owner was an architect, so that's why there's so many tables in here. Here is the kitchen. You can see appliances never been changed. Moist. This one's doing pretty good. I don't know how I'm gonna get some of this out of the house. Pantone 2024, color of the year. Let's go downstairs. This is my favorite feature of the house. First bedroom, I think they tried to renovate. Flooring and everything in here, look at this. But honestly, the people that lived here before, they were probably the coolest people on the block with this room. Do you guys wanna see outside? This is probably the best thing of the whole, the whole house. I got a pool. So I just bought an abandoned house a couple weeks ago and I have some issues that I wish it was a them problem, but they're, they're now my problems. First one is the roof is falling down. I, I just covered it up. Electrical doesn't really work in this house. That sounds very safe. This is the only light that works in the house. Is this mold? Is this why they put this here? This is mold! I got a pool. The only problem is I don't really know how to drain it. That looks really deep. Yeah, I'm not going down there. Are you going down there? You gonna take one for the team? So a few weeks ago, I bought this abandoned home and I found this magazine where our home is featured in. This is our home. This is our living room and kitchen. They replaced the kitchen. They actually renovated once. Look at this. Isn't that crazy? My doorbell. Look what it used to wow. look like back in the day. That's crazy. That's my coach.
light and fat. That's just the aspect ratio because it was a foam thing. So <laughs> I was thinking, oh, she looks a little round. You're probably wondering. <laughs> I wouldn't buy that home, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I might think about buying that home. I, I would, and I would say to my husband, boy, that home, home has good bones. And he would say, no, <laughs> just no. You're probably wondering what all this has to do with today's text and our series on Peter that we're following through Lent. It's embedded in that word, transformation. I kind of think Jesus liked a good makeover as well. Only he was definitely focused on renovating people and communities, and Peter was the greatest project of all. Throughout the Gospels, Peter's given a place of prominence among the disciples. He's the first to be called. He is the spokesperson for the other disciples. He's a great defender of Jesus, but also the ones who seems to question Jesus the most. He's at times brash and bold and at other times sheepish and repentant. I like to think of Peter as one of those hale and hearty kind of guys who works hard, plays hard, loves hard, fails hard, pure of heart, but rough around the edges. You might say Peter has a few cosmetic difficulties, but he has good bones. So today's text is about Jesus calling Peter to follow him. They're not unknown to each other at this point. Jesus has been preaching and healing around Galilee where Peter and Andrew, Zebedee and his two sons, James and John are partners in a fishing business. In the previous chapter, actually, Jesus has been to Simon's house where he healed his mother-in-law. This is the story in the Bible that bothers me the most because she's been sick, almost dead. Jesus comes, heals her, and then she gets up to serve them. So, you know, I'm thinking, couldn't someone else have made lunch that day? But that's just me. Peter is well aware of Jesus and his message. There's some suggestion that Peter may have met Jesus as part of the Baptist's community at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But between that time and this day at the beach with Peter, a lot has happened to Jesus to shape his thinking and his ministry. Because right after he's baptized and the sky opens up and the dove descends and the voice of God is heard, anointing Jesus as God's beloved child, Jesus enters the desert and he's tempted to give up his ministry in favor of money or glory or power. And 40 days later, he emerges in possession of his call, sure of what he's meant to do, and he goes back home to Nazareth. And he spends a day in the synagogue, as you would if you were a Jewish man, and he reads some scripture from Isaiah, and this is what it says. The Spirit of God is on me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of God's favor, which is the year of the Jubilee, the great reset. And then he sits and says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And his friends and neighbors are initially impressed with him. They've heard about what he's been doing in Capernaum, healings and preaching. Can you believe this is Joseph's boy? They say to each other, and look, he's chosen us to bestow God's favor. Isn't that wonderful? But Jesus pierces through their smug appropriation of his ministry with these words. The truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when there was severe famine in the land, but God was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. The widow was a Gentile. And there were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And at these words, the people of his hometown become furious because Jesus is essentially saying, you are not the only ones. This club is not exclusive. I am come for all humanity. And they run Jesus out of town, his hometown, where they know him as Joseph's son, to the edge of a cliff where they actually intend to throw him off. Now, that would have been a very short ministry indeed. But something stops them and it says that he walks through the crowd and no one says everything and then he moves on to Capernaum. What we see from the adventures of Jesus before he calls his disciple is a plan of God's kingdom on earth, good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the jubilee where the society is reset so that all share equally in the bounty. And further, this is not a message for the Jewish people alone. God's dream for the world extends beyond Israel to all humanity. Healy, hope, 
justice, bounty, freedom. These are the things Jesus is preaching. But it's clear Jesus can't do this alone. He needs the team if God's dream for humanity is to be realized. And this is exactly the kind of message that appeals to Simon. We call him Peter. Jesus renames him later to Peter. He says, you know, Peter means the rock. So in the commentary I was reading, they should think of it as Jesus calls him Rocky. You know, it's a nickname. See, Simon is struggling under the weight of the empire. He lives near a boundary between two areas that control by different sons of the last Herod. So duties are imposed on everything that moves across the border. And further, there's heavy taxes on their catch and user fees for boats to even go into the water and so on and so on. You know from our talk about Zacchaeus a while ago how hated tax collectors were because it was such a burden on the people. And even though Peter has his own business, they are still living close to poverty and prospects are not good. So no wonder Peter is drawn to the message of Jesus because finally there's some hope. Finally someone who makes sense. Finally a way out of the crush of the empire. So Simon and his partners are on the shore after having fished all night. And I understand fishing always happened at night, at least the way they did. They had a big net that they would cast and with weights and it would drop. And they did this because during the day the fish could see their nets and then avoid being captured. And so the morning was always the time when they finished the fish and they came in to clean their boats. And they're engaged in these very ordinary tasks of a fishing business. God always seems to arrive where in the midst of the mundane of your life, just doing the stuff you're meant to do, and suddenly there's a new way. Jesus says to them, you know, there's all these people here, they want to talk to me, I need a better vantage point, so can I take your boat, move it off the shore a bit? And Simon obliges, sure, Jesus, because this is Jesus after all, and he has done amazing things. And when he's done speaking, Jesus tells Simon and the rest to try fishing again, and remember, fishing's done at night, so this makes no sense to Peter at all, and he's exhausted. They'd fished for hours and caught nothing, but Simon says to Jesus, okay, but only because you asked. And he has no hope of success. He's humoring Jesus in a way, maybe because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. He owes him one. Maybe because he saw Jesus in a, is a slice of God that was irresistible. But what follows is the best catch they've probably ever had, a miracle, no doubt. So many fish, they need help dragging the net to shore. So heavy is the catch, the nets begin to break from the weight. And Simon, this hale and hearty fellow, sees this and he's humbled and filled with awe. And he falls down in front of Jesus and tells him to leave him because he is a sinner. I am not worthy of your attention, he says to Jesus. I've done things I'm not proud of. I've made a mess of so much of my life. I don't deserve this favor you have shown me. Go away from here and leave me to myself and my despair and all the things I've brought upon myself and in my impetuous, selfish, short-sighted existence. But Jesus knew what he was doing. And he sought out Simon. He saw that behind the bluster and the bragging and the head first into everything attitude, Simon had good bones. So Jesus says, don't be afraid, Simon, because from now on, notice he doesn't say, I know you're a sinner. Your sins are forgiven. He doesn't actually say that. He kind of ignores that part of Simon's repentance. And he says, don't be afraid, Simon, because from now on, we're going to fish for people. It's kind of a little joke between them, you know, a fishing joke. And they bring their nets to the shore and leave everything to follow Jesus, the text says. And I know some of you are a bit incredulous, like left everything, the biggest catch of their life. They left it to rot on the shore, their business, their families. Come on. And you'd be right. Because a subsistence worker like Peter does not give up what little they have. The business does not run itself. It continues. Very often they're in the boat fishing in Jesus' stories. What this verse is saying is that their focus shifted. 
Instead of living for work, they worked to live. Instead of giving all their energy to fishing, they shifted their focus to follow Jesus. And so begins their journey. In the book of Luke, the disciples never seem to get it. They stumble around. They don't understand what Jesus is teaching. They question everything. Peter even betrays Jesus when he needs him most. And the other disciples run away. But in the sequel to Luke, the book of Acts, these fishers on the shore of Galilee change the world. And finally, their renovation is done. The good bones are polished to a beautiful community of caring where love is lived. And I think sometimes we look at ourselves and think we're not worthy of a renovation, like that one house, <laughs> not worthy of a renovation. <laughs> We might carry shame for the things we've done or we've not done. Maybe we think we deserve to suffer. We hear this message of Jesus that says, you are worthy and everyone deserves a place at the table and together we can build a world where justice and freedom is available to everyone, but you can't see how we can be part of this. Depart from me, Jesus, I'm not up to it. I'm not your guy. But that's the beauty of the makeover. It's a communal endeavor. We do it together. We build the future that God dreams as the hands and feet of Christ. And just like Simon and the disciples, we struggle to find our place. We fail. We wonder why we started this whole thing and whether any of it could make a difference. I ran across another story of renovation this week. Kara Brookins is her name. She lives in Arkansas. And she had suffered through two abusive relationships and had been stalked by a person who was mentally ill. And she had four children and they didn't feel safe and she knew she needed a home, but she couldn't afford to buy one. But what she did find was some property where a house had been destroyed by a hurricane, but the foundation was still there. And she knew she and her four children needed a new start, that they deserved a safe place to live that could help them heal. So she bought the property and she took out a loan of $150,000 for all the materials. And she didn't know anything about building a house, but she started watching YouTube videos. So there, she learned how to frame a house how to pour concrete, how to lay bricks, and all the other skills you need to build a house. She brought her children into the project as well, and they all helped out. But the most important lesson of all was they learned how to rebuild a broken family. And today, they live in the home they built together. A safe place free of violence and uncertainty, all the better, because they did it together. Jesus sought out Simon to be part of building something, a community grounded in God, where love is lived and hope is proclaimed. And he asked them to leave everything they thought that would keep them secure, to release what they cling to that isn't really working for them, and to receive the kingdom of God among us, the relationship among us. Jesus seeks us in the very same way. Leave your nets, Jesus says. Let go of what you think is giving you security. Let go of those feelings of shame and inadequacy. Let go of that thinking that says you're done. You're too old. You can't change. Let go of the fear of the unknown. And remember, Jesus loves a renovation project. He sees your good bones. This is the promise. Together we can build the world that God intends where peace is possible, bounty is shared, freedom is lived, and everyone has a place at the table. May it be so. Amen. Our final hymn is Jesus, You Have Come to the Lake Shore. Stand with me as we sing that. <laughs> Oh.
thing. When Jesus calls you, we all feel so inadequate, right? What can I do is always, how can I live in the kingdom of God? But that's why he called more than one. A group of people that grew and grew and grew. The community of Christ that can change the world together. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.